The creation we have just seen in this video did not come about by chance through some nefarious Big Bang moment or through evolution. <clears throat> no, people of faith believe that there was a divine mind behind creation, behind the universe. And that mind belongs to God. And so today I will put forward four big ideas. Big idea number one is that God is the creator of the universe. On a clear night, you can look into the sky and see the majesty of the heavens. Last Sunday, we watched a video that spoke about the magnificence and size of the universe. There are stars, solar systems, and galaxies that have never been found by humans. They're out there somewhere. The more astronomers study the universe, the more they realize its vastness. We have no way of knowing how far the universe goes. We do know that this little ball we call Earth is only one of hundreds of thousands of planets in just our galaxy alone. And our galaxy is one of perhaps 200 billion galaxies. We're currently preaching through the book of Psalms. And when the psalmists looked at the universe, when they looked up at the night sky, they wondered at the majesty of it all. But behind it, they also thought of God. In the ancient world, many people worshipped the stars as gods or thought of them as angels. But when psalmists, such as the shepherd boy who would become King David, looked to the night sky, they realized that the heavens were speaking in a language universal and intelligible for all to understand. And that language was saying that God is behind it all and is to be worshipped. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that humans are without excuse. God is a creator and should be worshipped as such. Of the 150 psalms in the book of Psalms, at least six are referred to as creation psalms. Last week we looked at three of them, and this morning we will look at three more. These creation psalms declare the wisdom, the power, the plan, and the purpose of God as is seen in creation, as is seen in the heavens, the moon and the star, the moon and the sun, the stars, the solar system, and the galaxies, as well as our planet this wonderful world that we call Earth. God created it all, and everything is orderly, not in chaos. We read in Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. God created it all. He commanded it to be so. An order resulted. Yet still humans doubt. Why? When we go to God with such doubts. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaming seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where mornings dawn, where evenings fade. You call forth joys, songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. As a result, the psalmist, while thinking of the creation, could write this. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in a light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of its upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariots and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes wind his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. 
God's complete control and perfect design are seen on the earth in creation. The earth and the heavens are in perfect order, like a perfectly laid out tent with beams and a foundation. In, de in creation, God designed it with order. Think about this. He flung each planet and sun out into its place and told them to stay there. Even though planets circle the sun and solar systems circle around in their particular galaxy, God told them to stay where they are. They have order. To move out of that order would mean destruction. Consider these facts. The atmosphere around the earth, surrounding the earth, must stay in exact percentage. Nitrogen, oxygen, etc., etc., for you and me to be able to breathe. If it went out of its order, we would die. The ozone layer around the earth is there to protect human life from the harmful rays of the sun. It's in order. The ocean tides move with the change of the moon. And the moon changing to a full moon is a marker of time. It's a new month. Just as the sun rising and setting every day marks a new day. It's an order. God created our earth with perfect order. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. So if the Bible teaches that God, the first person of the Godhead that we Christians believe in and that we call the Trinity... If the Bible teaches that God was the creator of all that is, the natural follow-up question for we Christians who believe in the Trinity, the Godhead, concerns Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And the question is, is at the time of creation, was he also involved in creating all that is? Or was Jesus just a bystander, a spectator of the spectacular spectacle of creation? Did you like all those spe spes? I was so proud of myself. A spectator of the spectacular spectacle of creation. Was he perhaps cheering God, the Father, along during the conception of the world like a fan at a ball game? So here is how Christian theologians answer that question. Big idea number two. God the Father was the creator of the universe, but so was Jesus, the second member of the Trinity. The Gospel book writer John the Apostle, living in a then Greek society and knowing full well that the ancient Greek philosophers, though they didn't really understand about God, they, they loved the power of words. And so they believed that the ultimate power in the universe should thus be called the Word. And so the ultimate power they called the Word. And John identified that ultimate power in the universe as actually being Jesus. And so he begins his gospel book in this way about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through, all, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus was not part of the creation. He, instead, he was the creator. He is of the same essence and substance with the same powers and attributes as God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. There is no difference. Jesus created everything. That is, he was there at the beginning, involved in the creating. The Apostle Paul put it this way. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
So if God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, and God the Son, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, were both involved in creating all that there is, the next obvious question for the Christian mind concerns the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Was he also involved in creating all that is? Christians, Christian theologians say this, big idea number three. God the Father and God the Son were present at the time of creation, creating all that is, but so was the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so we read in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now the word hovering conveys the idea of a bird sitting in a nest, hovering and brooding over her eggs, caring for the new lives. And what a beautiful picture that is of God preparing to bring life into the world through his spirit, hovering over everything, each of us to bring life. And on this fascinating topic, we also should note the scripture describes a similar hovering of the Holy Spirit in one of the greatest miracles of all time, the miraculous conception of Jesus Christ. And the angels answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. So just as God the Father and God the Son were at work in creating, so was God the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Spirit is still at work creating, bringing life to all living things. And so the psalmist writes about God. When you send your Holy Spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So taking this set of big ideas one step further... We Christians then need to ask, what about humans? And so the big idea number four that I give to you this morning is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all were present, bringing all that there is into being at the time of creation. But God has invited we humans to care for creation. After all, God made creation for us to be sustained. The psalmist writes, food to eat, liquids to drink, oils to make our skin shine. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for the people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. And so can we as humans also be involved in creating? Yes, because of what the ancient Latin theologians called the imago Dei, the image of God, the concept that we human beings are made in God's image. Remembering that God is a three in one and that angels were not equal or part of God, we read this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all things he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Because we humans are made in the image of God, Imago Dei, we can create at least in the sense of caring for creation. God said, let us create human beings in our image. So the Godhead is implied there, the Trinity, in our likeness, Imago Dei, so that humans, so that they can have dominion over the created world and everything in it. All creation displays God's power and his design and his goodness but only human beings are said to be made in God's image. And the full theology of the image of God is beyond our scope here. But let me simply say this. 
that there's something about us that is uniquely like God. It would be ridiculous to believe that we are exactly like God. We can't create worlds out of pure chaos, and we shouldn't try to do everything God does. But to be in God's image this morning, I'm putting forward, is to do what he is able to do, exercise dominion. When the Lord God made the heaven or the earth and the heavens, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Creation is meant for our use, but not for our use only. Remembering that God declares the air, the water, the land, plants, and animals are good, reminds us that we are meant to sustain and preserve the earth, his creation. Our work of having dominion can either preserve or destroy the clean air, water and land, the biodiversity, the ecosystems, the biomes, and even the climate with which God has blessed his creation. Dominion is not the authority to work against God's creation, but the ability to work for it and with it. Today we have become especially aware of how the pursuit of human self-interest threatens the natural environment. We were meant, though, to care, to tend to the garden that creation is. Remembering that everything God created has order, there is no room in the human role in creation for disorder, for destruction, for widespread pollution, the making extinct of species, or the raping of the earth, as it is called. Doing any of that is a failure at the least to observe God's law and the norms for land, for crops, for birds and beasts, for this world. Ecological problems in the earth are the result of human sin, selfishness, and lawlessness. Pollution problems in the air and water and ground, overfishing, overhunting, the use of non-biodegradable items such as plastic, disposable water bottles which have clogged up the oceans. None of this is acceptable for we who are made in God's image to engage in. Now, as Christians, we cannot agree with today's eco-warriors who claim that productive human beings are the problem and that we are a virus on the earth. Eco-warriors glibly demand fewer people and livestock and less productivity. But the problem is not humans, it is sin. But eco-warriors refuse to bow the knee before God anyways, so they won't accept that. As Christians, though, we understand that human beings made in the image of God are designed to care for the planet, his creation. The garden sanctuary that is called Earth and which was first seen in the Garden of Eden was made for humans, the pinnacle of creation. Humans are to till the land, take care of the garden. As was seen in the naming of all the animals, have dominion over them, which means caring for them. And caring for all of creation displays God's care, rule, and glory. Thus we care for creation. Without humans to tend and keep the creation, the earth would be a boundless wilderness, inhospitable, out of kilter, comparatively non-productive. As Christians, we are to be agents of the restorative and renewing life of the gospel in every area of life, spiritually leading people to salvation and faithfully living out the mandate God has given to us to be good stewards of his creation. If we do not live out this mandate of being good stewards of the creation, 
at the very least our witness to others about the salvation and the new life that we have in Jesus Christ, we will be making null and void our witness. It will be tainted. Now the vastness of the heavens reminds us God is God and we are not. We are mere mortals, but we are agents, junior agents, true, with God and his creation. Creation is calling to us to believe in God and to accept our role as his agents of preservation as we till and tend the land and care for this wonderful world. So let us wonder at the glory of creation and work with God on this planet we call Earth. The commission from God to do so was given to human beings at the beginning, and it has never been rescinded. As we contemplate the heavens, gaze up at the night sky, observe the wonder of creation all around us, let us worship God the Creator, the one who created it all, God the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and let us accept our role of worshiping God while caring for his creation. Creation Calls, video by Brian Dirksen. We'll have lights again. Show. Sure. 
So let's stand for our benediction. Gracious Creator God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. We are in awe as we look at your creation and think of your creative abilities. And we are humbled that you invite us to participate in your creation, in the tending of it. Let us do so faithfully. And we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for